Let us come back again this morning to the Gospel of John, chapter 7. And let me remind you again, as I've done a number of times, that the whole purpose of this Gospel of John was to lead the reader, the hearer, to faith in Jesus Christ and to eternal life in him. And that purpose has been abundantly fulfilled over the centuries. God has used the message of this gospel over the last 2,000 years to bring many to a living faith in Jesus and to experience the salvation that is found in him alone. And this gospel, it is filled with uh, brief verses which succinctly point us to Jesus Christ and to his salvation. John chapter 1 verse 29, the words of John the Baptist, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 3.16 Perhaps the best known verse in the whole Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 5 and verse 24 Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me, has everlasting life, and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. John 10, verse 11, I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd gives his life for the sheep. John 11:25. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, yet shall he live. And in John 17, verse 3, in addressing his Father in prayer, he says, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And here, in chapter 7, in the passage which we are now looking at, in verses 37 and 38, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And so it's essentially to this great invitation, this great call of the Lord Jesus to come to him. It is to this that we are looking this morning. To remind ourselves of the context, it was the Feast of Tabernacles. Tabernacles was the third great annual festival of the Jews. It was obligatory upon every Jewish male of mature years to attend the Feast of Tabernacles. And on this occasion, Jesus went up to the feast, not in a public manner, but in a private manner, and most people were not aware of his presence. People were looking for him, and uh, there was a good deal of whispering and uh, furtive discussion about him. 
Opinion was divided among the people. Some were saying, he is a good man. Others were saying, no, he is a deceiver. And in the middle of the feast, Jesus went up openly into the temple and publicly taught. The temple to the Jews was the holiest place on earth. And Jesus stood in their holy temple. He stood before huge crowds of Jews who would have come from every part of the Roman Empire. There would have been literally millions present in Jerusalem at the Feast of Tabernacles. And Jesus stood before this great multitude and publicly taught to them and publicly defended his teaching and his miracles. There was a reaction. Many were astonished. They were taken aback at the wisdom and the authority with which Jesus spoke. And many were quite ready to believe that he was indeed the promised Messiah. But the leaders of the people were hardened in their hostility. Perhaps they were stung by the idea that was being put around among some that they do not arrest him because they know in their hearts that he is the Christ that he is the Messiah. Perhaps stung by that um, uh, suggestion, they desired all the more to kill him. And finally, we read that they took the step of sending officers to arrest Jesus. Verse 32, the Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Well, God willing, next week we will see what the outcome of that was. But meanwhile, Jesus continued his ministry, beginning with the warning that he would not be with them forever. Soon, he would return to the Father who sent him. And then he would be where they could not come. They had no idea what he was talking about. And there was speculation among them, what does he mean? Where is he going to go where we cannot? And then... On the last day of the feast, Jesus stood up again publicly before all the people and he spoke the words of our text. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Well, let us look more closely at these two verses, 37 and 38. We are told it was on the last day, the great day of the feast. This was the very climax of the seven or eight day festival. And it is significant that Jesus spoke to them on the last day. Because the following day, the multitudes would disperse. They would be on their way home to, not only to various parts of the land of Israel, but many of them would be going much further, returning to the various countries throughout the empire where they had their homes. And for many of them, there would be no further opportunity given to hear the Lord Jesus. If they came back 
to the Feast of Tabernacles the following year, Jesus would not be there. Because by then, he had been crucified, was raised from the dead, and had ascended to the right hand of the Father in heaven. By then, he would indeed have gone where they could not follow. And so given that those from the remoter parts of the, the empire certainly did not come three times a year to uh, Jerusalem to each of the major feasts, those who only came to tabernacles would probably not come again till the following year, and Jesus would no longer be there. And so uh, they would have no further opportunity ever in this world to hear the words of the Lord Jesus. And before they disperse, before they leave, our Lord stands and he cries out. He cries out in a loud voice for everyone to hear his words. If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. His desire was that all should hear. And it is the desire of Christ today that all mankind, every man, woman, young person and child, that all should hear the message of salvation. The commission to the Christian church is go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The gospel is for every human being. You must understand that in the gospel, God speaks to you. The gospel is a summons to you. It is as much a summons to you personally as if there were no world around you. As if there were no human race and no other people in the world. God speaks in his gospel. He speaks to all who hear it. And he says, come to Jesus Christ and have eternal life. And of course we cannot overlook the fact that one day each one will hear the gospel and it will be the last time. These people did not understand what Jesus was talking about and so almost certainly they did not realize that they were hearing his voice for the last time. And when someone today hears the gospel for the last time, in very few cases will they ever know that they will never hear it again. That Christ will never be preached to them again. And the only way to be sure of salvation in Jesus Christ is to respond today, to come Jesus says, if anyone thirst, let him come to me. Now, we all know what physical thirst is about. Physical thirst is that uncomfortable experience which impels us to drink, to take in the water that is necessary to the life and the well-being of our physical bodies. The human body can only live a matter of days without water. If you were to go home and not drink anything, and you were not on some kind of artificial um, rehydration system, if you were taking in no fluids, you would not be here next week because the human body has only a very short lifespan without water. 
and it is thirst which ensures that constantly we seek and drink the water which is essential to our life. We know what physical thirst means. We also understand the expression when it's used in a metaphorical sense. We talk, for example, about intellectual thirst, the, the thirst for knowledge, for understanding. Or we uh, speak about the thirst for fame, the thirst for celebrity, when someone craves and must be somebody important in the world. So we understand it not only in a physical sense, but also in its metaphorical sense. And Jesus is speaking in this metaphorical sense. He's speaking about something deeper, more profound than the experience of the body or simply of the, the mind. He is speaking about a thirst which needs to satisfy the very deepest requirements of the human spirit. Man has needs which cannot be satisfied with food. Jesus quotes elsewhere the words of Deuteronomy, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And man cannot be satisfied either with intellectual knowledge. He cannot be satisfied with success and fame and the praise of others. People may crave these things, but when they have them to the full, they still find that their thirst is not satisfied. How many times do you read of those who have attained the heights of fame and fortune, but they're turning to drugs, they're turning to alcohol, some of them end up killing themselves, putting an end to their life. Because in the midst of all that kind of success, there is a void, an emptiness, which they do not know how to fill. And you see, man was made in the image of God. Man was made for God. Man was made to know God, to worship, to serve God, to glorify God. Man was made to love God, his maker, with all his heart and soul and mind and strength. And the deepest need of every man, woman and child made in God's image is the need for God himself. St. Augustine was a man who was no stranger to thirst. He knew all about his own attempts to satisfy his inward thirst, to satisfy it with promiscuity, cohabiting with prostitutes and immorality and so on. He knew all about trying to satisfy it with philosophy and with intellectual knowledge. But he did not find in any of these things the satisfaction that his soul craved. There came the day when he was in the garden and he heard a voice. We don't know whether it was purely an internal voice in his own mind or whether he heard some child playing a game of some kind, but he heard a voice. And it said to him, take and read, take and read. And he was startled and he looked around and there on a garden bench he saw a book and it was in fact a copy of Paul's epistle to the Romans. And he picked it up and 
looked at it and his eyes fell upon words in Romans chapter 13 put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its desires and these words spoke powerfully to his heart and he turned to the Lord Jesus and he found in him the answer to the needs of his human heart and spirit. It's one of St. Augustine's prayers that he prayed. O Lord, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until we find our rest in you. He spoke that, he prayed that out of his own personal experience of these things. Well, the Old Testament uses uh, this picture of thirst for God. We read it in the opening verses of our first reading in Isaiah 55, uh, verse 1. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat, come buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread, and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good, and let your soul delight itself in abundance, incline your ear, and come to me. Hear, and your soul shall live. Or again, in Psalm 63, we have the psalmist praying in these words, O God, you are my God, early will I seek you, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. And my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. Let me ask you, what do you know about this thirst? Have you discovered that mere physical things cannot satisfy the deepest needs of your heart and soul. Man shall not live on bread alone. Have you discovered that other people cannot satisfy your deepest needs? Maybe some of you think that your greatest need is for a lifetime partner, a husband or a wife. I do not deny for a moment that that is a very real human need. But the Bible makes it very clear that even that will never satisfy the deepest needs of your heart. Have you discovered that knowledge, success in your exams, success in your school career and so on, that uh, may be fine and again uh, no one would say a word against that, but have you discovered that life is more than passing exams and getting qualifications? and having a certain expertise in some area that you're going to pursue in life? Have you discovered that these are not things which can ultimately satisfy the needs of a 
man or a woman made in the image of God? Have you stopped spending money on that which is not bread, laboring for that which cannot satisfy? Have you listened to the words of the prophet and above all to the words of the Lord Jesus? Have you come to God through Jesus Christ? Jesus says here, if anyone thirst, let him come to me. Come to the Lord Jesus. Why come to Jesus? First of all, because he is God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And Jesus, because he is the eternal second person of the Blessed Trinity, because he is divine, he is God, he is able to satisfy the deepest needs of the heart. In Isaiah 53, God, speaking through the prophet, says, Come to me. And in John 7, Jesus says, Come to me. You come to God by coming to Jesus Christ. And then secondly, you must come to Jesus because he is not only God, he is also man. The Word, who is God, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Son of God became man. There's a great gulf between the creature and the Creator. And there's a great gulf between the Holy God and sinful man. And however much you may thirst, you cannot come directly to God. How does a mere creature come to the infinite God? How can a guilty sinner approach the burning holiness before whom the seraphim veil their faces and hide their feet and cry out, Holy, Holy, Holy. How can you or I come into the presence of this God? But you see, God has come to us. God has come to us in the Lord Jesus. He came into this world taking upon himself a human nature. Not only a human physical body, but a human mind, a human spirit, human emotions, human feelings and affections. He became truly man. And as man, he lived a life in which he fulfilled all God's holy law. Jesus lived a life of perfect love, of perfect obedience to the Father. And in doing that, he did it as the representative of sinners. The representative of all who entrust their salvation to the Lord Jesus. And then, likewise, as a representative, he died under the judgment of God. He died in the place of sinners. But then he rose again from the dead. He was carried up into heaven. And now he appears before the face of God in heaven. He is still clothed in humanity, still in a physical body, still with a human mind and spirit, God and man united in that incomprehensible unity. 
where he appears as our representative, our high priest, our advocate with the Father. And we are told that he is able to save to the uttermost, to save completely, to save fully, to save forever those who come to God by him. He alone can save, but he can save to the uttermost. And here Jesus says, if anyone thirst, let him come to me. Who is he speaking to? He says, if anyone thirst, anyone, no exceptions, whoever thirsts, whoever is conscious of their inward need, even if, even if at the present time they could hardly explain or hardly understand what it really is, whoever is restless, whoever is dissatisfied, whoever is disillusioned with the idols of this world, whoever longs to know true meaning and purpose, the purpose for which God made you, let him or let her come to Jesus Christ. Remember among the hearers who were listening to Jesus, among the people addressed, there were Pharisees. The Pharisees were very moral and upright people, law-keeping people. But Jesus addresses them, let them come to me, you won't find satisfaction, you won't find the fulfillment that you need in your attempts to keep the law. You will only ever be a failure. Let the Pharisee come to me and drink. He was speaking also to the Sadducees. Now the Sadducees were the other main party and they were very different from the Pharisees. They were by and large worldly people, money-loving, self-serving. Yes, they were very religious as well, but it didn't stop them loving their money and their own self-interest. And Jesus speaks to them as well. Come to me. Come and abandon these foolish things that so obsess you. Come and find life in Jesus Christ. The common people, he was addressing masses and masses of the common people and many of them were in a state of total confusion. They didn't know what to think. They were perplexed by the attitude of their leaders and so on and the evidence of their eyes before them in the person of Jesus. They were confused and bewildered. But let them come. Let them come to Jesus Christ and he will satisfy their deepest needs. Some of these people to whom Jesus is speaking, that vast multitude, some of them had committed grievous sins. Some of them were guilty of sexual sins. Some of them were guilty of fraud and deception. Some were guilty of having neglected their religious duties, their duties to their families and so on. Yes, but whoever they are, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. It is a gospel, a message to be preached to every creature under heaven. We are to tell every human being there is eternal life for you if you will but come and receive it as a gift from Jesus Christ. What does it mean to come to Jesus? Well, to come is clearly the same as believing. In verse 37, if anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. To come and to believe are the same thing. It reminds us, of course, that believing is much more 
than simple intellectual agreement, intellectual assent. The, war, the, the Bible uses these pictures, these other words, for believing, come to me, look to me, hear and your soul shall live, call upon. And it implies clearly something very personal. You don't come to a mere theory. You can believe a theory as a matter of pure intellect, but you cannot come to a theory. You cannot come to a fact. You come to a person. This is a personal matter, putting your faith and trust in Jesus. It's coming to receive. It's coming for a purpose, coming to obtain what Christ desires to give you. It's coming to bring yourself to him, to place yourself in the hands of Jesus Christ. And then he says, let him come to me and drink. And to drink is not something uh, very different from believing, but it emphasizes again the, the receptive aspect. Believing is coming to receive what Christ gives. Believing is taking to ourselves, stretching out an empty hand to take, to receive, to grasp, to lay hold of the free gift of God in Jesus Christ. Come and drink. What is this gift which Jesus gives, which we can receive from him? Well, in a broad sense, we may take it as everything to meet the deepest needs of the human spirit. What are these things? First of all, reconciliation with God. Peace with God. Forgiveness. Deliverance from condemnation. Peace of conscience. And then, the knowledge of God as our Father. Membership of the family of God. And then purpose in living. A new purpose, a new aim, a new goal, a new reason to live. To glorify the God who made me and saved me. And hope for the future. The hope of an eternal inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. And all of these things have been purchased for the believer by Jesus Christ. But they are applied to us, they are applied to us by the Holy Spirit. And the Gospel promises to us not only objective reconciliation, the forgiveness of sins and so on, but also the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus continues in verse 38, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart or out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. This he spoke concerning the Spirit whom those believing in him would receive for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. He who believes in me out of his inner being will flow rivers of living water. We need to emphasize very strongly that the gospel is not only forgiveness, only freedom from condemnation, it is also about the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Christian life is life in the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? Like Jesus, the Holy Spirit is God. 
He is the third person of the ever-blessed Trinity. And he's constantly linked with the other persons. We are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The benediction which we hear every week, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. We are saved by the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Peter, in his first epistle, he speaks about Christians being elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Again and again, we have the Holy Spirit mentioned along with the Father and with the Son. And so when Jesus promises the gift of the Holy Spirit, he is promising one who is himself God. And we said at the beginning that the deepest need of every human being is God himself. And the promise of the gospel to those who come to Jesus is that God in the person of the Holy Spirit will come to you. He will come and dwell within you. You will become a temple of the Holy Spirit, a dwelling place of God himself. It is this that ultimately distinguishes the believer from the unbeliever. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. When Jude wants to describe the hypocrites in the church, he describes them as being sensual persons who do not have the Spirit. The crucial distinction between a believer and an unbeliever is that the Christian believer is indwelt by God the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit who leads the believer into holiness. Again and again the, the New Testament appeals to Christians to live holy lives. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is within you. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed. The Spirit is in you. You are able by God's grace to live a holy life. Well then, do it in the power of the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is God's answer to our thirst. Not only forgiveness, freedom from condemnation, justification, adoption, but also the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God to dwell in our hearts and lives. To whom then is the Holy Spirit given? He is given to the one who believes in Jesus. He who believes in me, out of his innermost being, will flow rivers of living water. Christ alone is able to give the Holy Spirit to those who put their faith in him. The Lord Jesus, by his sinless life and his atoning death, secured for every believer the forgiveness of sins, and he has also secured for every believer the gift of the Holy Spirit. After his resurrection, just before he ascended into heaven, he said this to his disciples, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And then when the day of Pentecost came, the disciples were with one accord in one place. There came the sound from heaven, the tongues of fire, 
and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And then later on the same day, Peter stood in front of the multitudes gathered this time at the Feast of Pentecost and he said to them, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit who came following the glorification in heaven of the Lord Jesus. The promise of the Father given to Christ to pour upon his people. The Spirit came upon the disciples. And then the Spirit is given to all who believe in the Lord Jesus. To all who come to him. And that is the same promise that we have here in the words of our Lord himself. If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But you must come to Christ. You must entrust yourself wholly to him. You must come and drink. You must come and receive freely the life-giving Holy Spirit. Why should you not call upon him, come to him, receive him this very day? May God bless his word all our hearts.